In these series of videos on key scenes from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, the aim will be to help you think and work more independently about ideas, characters, language and themes within the play. Simply listening and nodding will be insufficient. I will regularly ask you to do something, whether that is to make notes, annotate or answer some questions. However, each time I ask you to do this, I will do the same, so you will be able to compare your own answers to mine and thus develop your understanding further. Studying Shakespeare takes time. Do not expect to understand every word or allusion on your first reading or indeed after multiple readings or viewings of productions. However, the more time you put in, the more your efforts will be rewarded. So stay tuned. Let's study Act 1, Scenes 1 to 2 of Shakespeare's joyous comedy, Twelfth Night. This is Schofield on Shakespeare. This video works on the assumption that you have already independently read Act 1, Scenes 1 to 2, either for the first time or ideally for the second time having read the full play. If this isn't the case, stop watching the video now, grab your copy of the text and enjoy before returning. Time for my brief summary of the two scenes. First, Act 1, Scene 1. We are introduced to the dreamy, music-loving Duke Orsino, hopelessly, drearily obsessed with the Countess Olivia. Unfortunately, the feeling is not reciprocated. The reason given is that following the death of her brother, she needs a good seven years to be alone, weeping. Orsino is seemingly impressed rather than demoralised by this extraordinary long period of time, and he reckons that this may imply exciting potential for a powerful, passionate future relationship with a lucky man, hopefully of course himself. Now for Act 1, Scene 2. Viola has survived a terrifying shipwreck and has landed disorientated and confused on the shores of Illyria. It would appear that her twin brother Sebastian has not been so fortunate, although the captain did see him clinging on to a broken mast disappearing into the horizon. A captain tells Viola about Orsino and his feelings towards Olivia. Worried about her situation as a single, potentially vulnerable woman, Viola first suggests that she could serve Olivia. However, the audience find out that this isn't possible, and that Olivia hasn't just recently lost her brother, but her father too. Viola resolves to disguise herself as a eunuch to bide her time serving Orsino. Time now for you to look at these scenes in more detail. Some questions are going to appear on screen shortly. Read through these questions now. Grab your pen and aim to write some reasonably detailed answers, including quotations, if possible. This video will resume in five seconds time, so press pause now to get started. Here's my first quotation for this exploration of Orsino, and appropriately enough, these are also the lines which open the play and set the tone for the play as a whole. Here he immediately draws attention to his own supposed suffering for love and suggests a potential cure. If music indeed feeds and sustains love, it might be possible to have too much of it and thus lose your own appetite for loving, and in his case, suffering. However, as the rest of the scene and play unfolds, it is clear that Orsino has no desire whatsoever to stop loving Olivia and the audience get the impression that this is a self-indulgent young man with a great deal, probably too much time on his hands. We get the impression that he is clearly reveling in the attention and melodrama of unrequited love. Or put otherwise, he may well be in love with the idea of being in love. 
It's important to note that the play starts with music, which Orsino directs and shuts down according to his whimsy. Twelfth Night is a play full of music, and even in these early scenes, its importance is also implied through references to Orion, a legendary Greek lyre player, and the, f and the fact that Viola also has plenty of ability in this area. She can sing and potentially speak to Orsino in many sorts of music. But the type and style of music used in the production will invariably affect the mood as much as the language. The music from one Australian production from 1986 decided to go for a jazzy, carnivalesque feel and set, thus making it difficult to take much notice of Asino's wallowing nonsense. If music be the flute of love. Play on. Give me excess of it. The presence of Snoggers, Mariah and Sir Toby already dancing joyfully with each other, Sir Andrew Aguchik already larking about, and yes, even Mal Malvolio looking grumpy within this initial sequence, firmly sets the tone and scene. This, Illyria, is a place of fun, love and laughter. If Orsino is going to choose to be melancholy, it will not last for long and will be quickly forgotten. Here's my second quotation, which references the mythical tale of Actaeon and Diana, the chaste goddess of the hunt. As depicted within this rather splendid oil canvas by Titian, painted between 1556 and 1559, Actaeon had the fortune, or perhaps in retrospect, misfortune, of coming across Diana and her nymphs bathing in the nude. To punish him, Diana turned the young peeper into a stag, which was subsequently hunted and killed by his own bloodthirsty hounds. What is the effect of this mythical comparison? Well, the implicit reference to Greek mythology suggests that Orsino is an educated, imaginative chap who clearly feels the need to reach out beyond his own comparatively mundane fields of reference to describe his own, in his eyes, extraordinarily elevated feelings. However, the fact that Diana is seen naked within the Greek myth hints at some hidden feelings of lust on Orsino's part, whilst the metaphorical positioning of, him, of himself as being pursued by hounds positions himself as a kind of sadomasochist. He is enjoying inflicting all this pain on himself through his utterly unencouraged and doomed quest to win the heart of Olivia. And my final quotation. If read within a more modern context, these lines would be seen as rather effeminate. I'm just going to lie down and think about love amongst sweet beds of flowers. However, this rhyming couplet does fit in with what we have seen of Orsino so far. He is someone who clearly appreciates the vivid, natural beauty of Illyria and uses these fragrant smells and sights to feed his poetic, removed from reality, fantasies. Question 2. What impression do we get of Olivia through Valentine? Comment on the simile used to describe her determined mourning. Well, it's hard not to question the proportionality of Olivia's self-imposed seven-year mourning term following the death of her brother. This does seem somewhat excessive, as does the quantity implied within the image of her watering once a day her chamber with her tears. At this early stage of the play, it would be tempting and accurate to suggest that this extravagant figure may have been given out in an attempt to put Orsino off in his very public attempt to woo her, as revealed by the captain in the following scene. The simile, like a cloistress, refers to a nun having to remain indoors within very limited confines. Sound familiar, anyone? And the overall impression is that this is a woman who at this point in time is determined to have as little contact as possible with anyone at all outside her home. However, I wonder whether the reference to her veil may point to a lack of vision and perspective in her approach. However natural it is to mourn a brother, refusing to see out beyond your own narrow confines may not be the best approach. 
Which brings us on naturally enough to question three and the contrast between someone else who believes she has lost a brother and Orsino. Is this term polar opposites accurate or helpful? Here's a table which I'm going to use for the basis of my argument. Let's go into more detail. I've already talked about Orsino's dreamy musings. What a contrast with his future wife. Sorry for the spoiler if you weren't already aware. Yes, quite understandably, she desperately asked the captain as to whether there was a chance that her twin brother may have survived, but very quickly she moves to practical information gathering so that she can maximise her own chances of survival and, ideally, something approaching comfort and prosperity here on shore. Her offering the captain gold for not closing the door on hopes that her brother may have survived is an obvious easy way to make her first ally on these foreign shores. Meanwhile, note the caesura in line 21. It ushers in a complete change of subject and a straight to the point question. Should she use any more of her limited time chatting to this captain? What other helpful information might he be able to impart? One would imagine that if he had replied no, Viola would have said thank you very much and walked off to find someone else. Some critics have interpreted the lines on screen, particularly the bachelor then phrase, as a clear clue that Viola thinks incredibly early about the possibility of ensnaring Orsino as a husband. This interpretation could make her seem more cynical than practical. The 1970 British TV version seems to adapt this approach and starts to play with Viola and the captain before cutting back to show our dreamy duke. Very Good governors here. A noble duke, in nature as in name. What is his name? Orsino. Orsino. I have heard my father name him. He was a bachelor then. Orsino's power is self-evident in his title, his ability to click his fingers at musicians and Valentine, and the fact he can afford to waste so much time talking rubbish. Viola, by contrast, recognises her own vulnerability. Lamenting her own perilous position on the seashore of an unknown different country, she cries referring to Olivia, All oh, that I serve that lady and might not be delivered to the world till I'd made mine own occasion mellow what my estate is. Implicit in these words are the idea that, as a woman, she is vulnerable, and thus she needs time. She needs time to be able to suss out the situation and dynamics within this alien territory. As a woman, there is a sense that she feels terrified about being delivered and displayed for all and sundry in Illyria, and having to adapt to life without any guiding, supportive male figures, particularly, presumably, her just-deceased brother. Orsino will love Olivia. He will continue to love her or convince himself that he loves her, irrespective of that woman's wishes. Viola, in contrast, doesn't have this luxury to be able to stick determinedly to one particular standpoint or position. When she hears that she won't be able to serve Olivia, she rapidly changes her plan to one which is more likely to succeed, disguised as a eunuch in order to serve Orsino. Of course, in Shakespeare, women disguised as men are ten to a penny, and they quite often have good fun. However, for Viola to have transformed from bereaved, nearly drowned herself, mourning sister, to adroit, quick-thinking, fake eunuch to be, within the space of around 60 lines, shows impressive malleability. Already, the audience is likely to feel that this woman may make a success of her future endeavours, as indeed it proves. Whereas Orsino babbles guff such as, O spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou, that notwithstanding thy capacity receiveth as the sea, Viola has something genuinely tragic to deal with, the probable death of her brother. But look at the far greater simplicity and quiet dignity of her language. She cries, and what should I do in Illyria? My brother, he is in Elysium. Perchance he is not drowned. What think you, sailors? Elysium is heaven, or the place blessed human beings go after dying. Note Viola's sentence length, just one factual main clause for my brother, he is in Elysium, and then another one at the beginning of the subsequent sentence. 
This woman is remarkably dignified and simply doesn't go in for blabbing and wittering self-pitying fare. She would have made an unsatisfactory social media user in today's world. Question four, the challenges for the actress playing Viola. An interesting one. Of course, her very adaptability makes her harder to portray on stage. One minute, presumably, she needs to be looking close to death and close to tears. The next, she needs to come across as far more purposeful, strategic and forward thinking. Looking ahead to the rest of the play, you also have the confusing gender role playing. This is actually the only scene in which Viola appears in her maid's garments. The rest of the time within a modern production, the female actress would need to be relatively convincing and look vaguely like a man. Back in Shakespeare's time, it would have been even more complicated. A boy would have played the part. He would then need to convince as Viola, and then later as a boy dressed up as a woman who is passing herself off as a page. The eunuch idea is not taken up again. The other issue is that the actress playing Viola will also typically end up playing her twin brother Sebastian as well. But we'll come back to these issues in a later video or discussion. The 2018 Adam Smethurst production starred Sheila Atim as Viola and Sebastian. She had very short hair playing both male and female parts, which perhaps made it easier for her to seamlessly switch more convincingly between genders. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production, encouraging you to think more closely about Act 1, Scenes 1 and 2 from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. Many thanks for watching.